are three angels named in the Bible, Michael, Gabriel, and Lucifer. Two of them are still in place. One is not. But instead of the worship coming through him, he wanted it to come to him. And so God had to kick him out because nobody can handle worship but the living God. And nobody is worthy of worship but the living God. And the reason why the enemy hates you so much is because you and I get to worship God out of choice. He failed once and got kicked out. We fail all the time and he still wants to hear from us. My church, there we go, there we go. That's what I'm looking for. God is good. Okay, there's one answer. That's going to come back up later, so I hope you all remember that. Um, So this Sunday, so we've been doing um, a series about praise and worship. It's been absolutely uh, fantastic and refreshing and necessary. Uh, One, because as you look at us up here, um, I'd argue to say some would probably view it as worship almost being our job. Um, technically, by title, I'm, I'm the worship director here, and so, you know, it would seem as though my whole life should revolve around cultivating um, the experience and what that should look like and constantly being in the presence of God and just always being prepared. But when you're in a constant state of a thing, sometimes it can feel like you've lost that spark, like Kevin said earlier. Um, and so for me, this series has been very refreshing. I've had the, the privilege and the opportunity to share a message with you all on worship before. Um, and I think by the grace of God, it was very insightful, at least to me. Um, it changed my perspective on a few things, and it, it brought a lot of personal humility for myself and gaining better understanding of what I perceive worship to be. Since then, not that that message is not still applicable, but I feel like Um, My understanding of worship has just expanded just a little bit. Um, So just going back to that previous sermon, the conclusion that I came to was that worship is the visible, audible, and mental or mental expression of luring one's own self in acknowledgement of the perceived glory of the one in whom it's directed to. It is the outward manifestation of our spirit bowing before the one in whom our reverence is directed. That is a mouthful. However, the problem, I don't, I don't want to say problem, the, the, the wall that I run into is that by that definition, the worship can be applicable to other things, which is why we have idols, which is why we worship celebrities, which is why we worship our personal heroes. We can worship them based off of who we perceive them to be, and we give outward expressions of it, our thoughts consist of it, the way we live can consist of that. You've got whole people who literally get plastic surgery to look like Michael Jackson because they worship him. They literally, they surround their whole lives with claiming his identity. That's a form of worship. So the sermon that I want to come to you today with is worship in its proper perspective. So worship in perspective can't have that same definition that I came to because how many know that worship alone belongs to the Lord above. Anybody know that? Amen. Um, So in order to put worship in this proper perspective, we have to know who it is that we're worshiping. Because how can we properly give him what he's due if we don't understand who he is exactly? So in order to court someone, in order to date someone, in order for you to acknowledge them for who they are, you kind of have to have an idea of what they like their personality. So if I take an introvert out to an event where there's a thousand people, then I don't really know that person well. Alternatively, if I take an extrovert and I want to sit in the house all day, that extrovert's not going to be that happy. Um, And that's kind of my real life. Monica hates sitting inside. She likes to keep moving and uh, I'm very introverted and very lazy. So that is a challenge. 
But let's put things in perspective. Let's, let's understand together. Let's get an idea of what the Bible says about God the Father, God the Son, and of course, by extension, God the Holy Spirit. Um, let's start with God the Father. I note that uh, Jesus says in Matthew that no one knows the Son except for the Father. And no one knows the Father except for the Son, except to those whom he reveals him to. And so by the grace of God, I just pray that he reveals himself just a little bit more to us by the grace of his Son. But before we kick that off, I just want to go ahead and pray um, and be in alignment with God. So Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity, um, for this moment where a collective of people who believe in you, who have put their faith in you, have gotten together to lift you up, to magnify you, to give you praise, and to worship you for who you are. And I just pray that you would give us the wisdom and the knowledge through the gift of your Holy Spirit to understand you just a little bit more so that when we choose to do these acts in worship for you, when we choose to live a life in worship for you, that we do it with the perspective of who you said you are and not who we always perceive you to be. And so, Lord, in this message, I just ask that the Holy Spirit would lead, that it would only be the truth of your word, and if there's anything um, that is not of you, I ask that you would shut my mouth and uh, convict me. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, so we want to start out with how, just a few scripture and how God um, is defined in the Bible. Now, I'm going to say, I'm going to put some scriptures on the screen. I'm going to say some names. Not all scripture will be up there. If you're the note-taking type, please get your notes out on your phone. If you're still pen and paper, um, you should probably switch to a phone because you can lose pen and paper, but write it all down. Um, so the first verse, everybody in here should know it, is uh, John 3.16. If you don't know that by now, see me after service and we'll pray for you. Um, John 3.16 calls God the Father. Moving on, John 4.24 calls him Spirit. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 says that God is light. And there's a little parallel that I want to go here. So I'm going to actually read uh, that verse and put some things in perspective that I like. Uh, that verse reads, This then is the message which you have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And I thought it was really cool that that is 1 John 1, 5. But if you um, jump over to John chapter 1, verse 5, and the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended, comprehended it not. So it's talking about Jesus in verse 4 and 5. So you got 1 John 1 and 5, and John 1 and 5, who both talks about God being light. So I thought that was a cool numbers uh, parallel. Moving on, we have 1 John 4 8, which says that God is love. And I know I'm moving fast, so um, if you get the chance, go back and, and watch this and just note all these things. Study these scripture in context, this is, again, just me going through a list of things that the Bible defines the Father as. Second Samuel 7.22 says that God is sovereign. John 17.3 says that God is eternal life and the only true God. Psalms 86.5 says that God is good. God is good and all the time. You passed the test. I'm so proud. My little brother didn't pass that this morning. He was dozing off as I was trying to give him this sermon. Um, Zephaniah 317. That's not a book that I hear quoted super often. Um, so that might be worth an area of study. Zephaniah 317 calls him a mighty warrior. Isaiah 44, 6. And I'm going to read through that one because it calls him quite a few names in that one. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel... And his, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no other God. So these are just a few things that the Bible refers to as the Father. I want to make a, um, a quick point just in um, support of Trinitarian doctrine. If you don't believe in the Trinity, come see me after as we'll talk um, or email me, and we can set up some lunch or something. Um, but in the Bible... Specifically in that uh, verse in Isaiah 44, 6, um, it says he's the only God. And God in the Hebrew there is defined as Elohim, which is plural. Elohim 
defined as God is mentioned 2,600 times in the Old Testament. There we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit who have worked in tandem since before creation and through creation and still currently. Um, I was having a conversation with Toddy last night. I was uh, in the sanctuary um, going down a rabbit hole uh, because in studying this in who he is, and I'll touch on this um, as I get to the sermon, the significance and how the Trinity works together to make all that you see happen. And so you have those who would define parts as not God. They'll define Jesus as just a man. Uh, They'll define the Holy Spirit as just a means to the way that he gets done. And then it's just God Almighty, and then you have these two plus ones. But no, the triune God has been in effect since before the very first scripture was written and has established him themselves, one God, three persons, since verse one of the Bible. And so I think that is a beautiful thing. Before diving into this context, I did not understand the Godhead as good as I thought I did. And that blessed me, and I hope that it blesses you too. Um, So those are just a few ways in which uh, the Bible defines God the Father. Now let's talk about the Son. And there's a million different verses A million different verses in which I can reference to talk about the Son. But one thing that really uh, marinated with me uh, was Hebrews 1. And um, so let's just read from that a little bit and um, get some understanding. So Hebrews 1. God, the Father, who had sundry times and in diverse manners, spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophet. And in uh, verse 2. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom he also made the worlds. And Toddy, I'm not going to go off the deep end, I promise you. Um, I went off the deep end last night. I couldn't sleep. I was up till maybe three in the morning, um, starting with the scripture, um, and understanding how the triune God worked through creation, and that God the Father, through the word, created the worlds by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so, putting Jesus in context. So we have, can I pull up verse 2 again? I want to read that again, and then I want to give you a couple of scriptures to ponder on and study for yourselves, because I think it's just worth investing in. I actually would like to get a Bible study together for this, so Pastor Matt, we'll have to set that up. Um, Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom he also made the world. So I was like, by whom he made the world? So um, what does that mean? Um, let's jump over to uh, Colossians 1.16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, and this is referencing Jesus. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. So I'm like, okay, that's interesting. So the people who say that Jesus wasn't who he was until he walked earth. They're not understanding that God the Father, through the Son, by the power of the Holy Spirit, created the heavens and the earth. Um, Further adding on to that, and I might be doing this out of order, uh, Beth. If if so, I'm sorry. We have uh, Ephesians 3.9. And this, of course, isn't in the complete context, but it stands to say the same thing. And to make all men see... What is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ? And then moving on to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6. But to us there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. And the NLT, um, which is a, a good translation of this too, says that creation was through Jesus Christ. So in the beginning, God the Father, by the Son, by the power of the Holy Spirit, created all things. And so we have people who would minimize the deity of Jesus to just being the one who came with the, with the intent from the foundation of the earth to die for us, to deliver us from sin. But not only did he do those things, he had first hand in the creation of us too. And so imagine the perspective that puts that in. His own creation, though he willingly gave his life, his own creation chose to kill him. 
And of course, like this seems like common knowledge to most people. We think, yeah, God created the heavens and earth. But God, through Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, created the heavens and the earth. And they looked their creator in the face and spat on him. And they beat him beyond recognition. And they nailed him to a tree. And he gave up the ghost. So could you imagine something that you've poured all of your passion, your heart, and your love into and you having to die for that thing because they made a, a choice to separate from you. And so like the, the anguish that he felt just continues to make more and more sense to see that, wow, my creation, my people, those I've loved since the beginning of time turned away from me. And not only that, but they hate me. And if they knew me, they wouldn't. And so we have Jesus here being acknowledged by the Father as creator. And so like, and I'll briefly touch on this, but I, I wonder, I'm like, well, if, if the Bible is acknowledging Jesus as the creator, how does, where does that put God the Father? Well, God the Father was the one who spoke. He's by God the Father's power through the Son, creation, through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says in John chapter 1, verse 1, this, was, this is what all clarified it for me. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So there you have the Father and the Son working in tandem as the Holy Spirit hovered over the face of the water. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him not any, not him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Going back to that reference from earlier, and the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. So we have the Bible acknowledging the Trinity here. And so we're putting things in perspective. We understand the Father through the Son, because the Son has decided to let us know more about him through his power. And so now we have Jesus in slightly better perspective. With that, I spent enough time on verse 2. Let's jump back over to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. And we'll keep going from there to verse 4. Being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. So we're naming off a few things we, that he's there. He's, he's named so much better than the angels, the son of God, the creator. There's, there's so many things that are being attributed to him uh, by God the Father. So we're going to jump over to verse 5 and I'm going to read through to verse 8. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. He didn't say that to any of the angels. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he saith, Who maketh his angel spirits and his ministers a flame of fire? And then coming into verse 8. But unto the Son, he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom. So here again, we have the Father acknowledging the Son as part of the Godhead. He says, thy throne, O God. He's placing him to those again who would deny the, the deity of Jesus Christ. God is saying, Jesus is God. Jesus is God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. There is a trinity. There is an Elohim. The Father calls the Son God. And to a lot of people, to, you know, you know the Jehovah's Witnesses, to the Seventh-day Adventists, there's a lot of sects of Christianity who just don't believe that Jesus shares in that role. They just believe that he came and he did what he did and that that earned him much favor with God, but he is not shared in the glory in the mantle of God of the Godhead and so we go to the next verse we go over to verse 9 where he further affirms it thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity 
Therefore, God, referencing, referencing the Son, even thy God, and now referencing himself, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Now, if we have anybody who really dives into the text, we'll see that this is a callback to Psalms, I believe, 45, um, either verse 6 or 7. It's a poem, um, a messianic poem about Jesus the Christ and, his, and the wedding with the church. Um, and so it brings these things back into confirmation in Hebrews chapter 1 where it acknowledges that the son was being referenced in that 45th Psalm as God. Oh God. And so again, the Trinity is very real. There's a reason why the Bible chose to use the word Elohim. Um, so they are all intended with each other. With that, I'm just going to read through the rest of um, Hebrews 1. And I'll kind of breeze through this. And thou, Lord, I'm calling him Lord. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth. Again, coming back to saying that Jesus laid the foundation of the earth. He, he was this, the instrument in which God the Father created all things by the power of the Holy Spirit. And thou, Lord, in the beginning has laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they shall all wax old as doth the garment. And as a vest, vest, vesture thou, <laughs> shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. But to which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand? until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? So again, maybe everybody knew this, and, and I had an idea of this, but to see it all spelled out, I don't even think I fully understood Jesus' role in all things that were to come. I knew about his works, I knew about him coming to earth wrapped in flesh. I knew about him dying on the cross, but I didn't know that it was spelled out so intricately that the Father, through the Son, created the heavens and earth by the power of the Holy Spirit. So, of course, Jesus is everything. He's my all, but now my perspective is just a little bit better. And in my worship, I'm just a little bit lower because now I see I've already thought you were all there is to be. And in my limited perspective and understanding, the all that I thought you were couldn't encompass the all that you really are. And so he continues to reveal himself and to make himself known. And I'm so blessed um, to be able to be in the mind to understand what he's trying to communicate. And so I'm, I'm grateful to God for that. That being said, let's jump over to Revelation 5. And I'm going to try to move through this quickly because I don't want to hold you hostage. But Revelation 5, we're going to read uh, verses 1 through 4. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne, and this is John talking in the book of Revelation. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within, and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven, nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept. I was devastated. I sobbed. I cried. You can look at the different translations. He was utterly devastated. He wept. He was distraught because no man was found worthy to open and read the book, neither to look thereon. And we're going to uh, hold it there in, in Revelation. But why was he so devastated? Okay, at face value, okay, oh, wow, like, can nobody do this? Why is it so important? Let's jump over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, starting at verse 3. If the good news we preach is hidden behind a veil, it is hidden only from the people who are perishing. And then verse 4 says, Satan, who is the god of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand his, this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. In that verse, it refers to Satan as the god of this world. And so if there's no one worthy to open the scroll, who's going to de dethrone the pretend king? Who's going to move him out of the way so that God's plan for eternal salvation and his plans for the earth and the completeness of the book of Revelation, how can these things move forward? How can that false king be dethroned if nobody is worthy to kickstart it? But then verse 5 gives us some hope of Revelation. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. 
Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and loose the seven seals thereof. I definitely dropped the ball on not doing Is He Worthy this Sunday. But to, to, to look at the idea of a future where the Son of God had not done what he did and the pretend king or the pretend God of this world to be able to run amok and continue to cause destruction and havoc and sin to run rampant if nobody was deemed worthy. But the Lord God, Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, wrapped himself in flesh and came to earth, took all of our sins, and he was slain. Let's put this in perspective because the Old Testament speaks about this as well. We're going to go to Isaiah 52, starting at verse 13. And this is the Bible prophetically speaking about the Messiah that was to come. See, my servant will prosper, and he will be highly exalted. And let me point out why I'm going to the specific one. Because the Bible in Revelation calls him the lion. But when John saw him, he saw him as of a lamb that was slain. So why is that significant? Verse 14, but, to, but many were amazed when they saw him. His face was so disfigured, he seemed hardly human. And from his appearance, one would scarcely know he was a man. And he will startle many nations. Kings will stand speechless in his presence, for they will see what they had not been told. They will understand what they had not heard about. You see, the angel called him the lion, but when John looked at him, he saw him as a slaughtered lamb. And that was messianic from the older verses. But why does he look like that? What, what happened? So if we jump over to chapter 53 of Isaiah, verse 5, well, why does he look that way? Because he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. And so the angel calls him by who he is, and John recognized him in that moment for what he had done. And so again, putting it in perspective, this is the Jesus that we worship. Moving down to verse 7 of uh, Revelation 5. Sorry about that. Revelation 5, verse 7. Or verse 6, I'm sorry. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits sent forth into all the earth. And I'm going to have you leave that verse up. Um, Seven horns and seven eyes. And when, the, when Revelation gets symbolic like that, I always wonder, like, am I picturing a half-dead lamb with seven horns and seven eyes? That'd be really creepy. So I'm like, well, what, what does the Bible mean? What is, that, what is that describing? Well, horns in the Bible are a symbol of power. And the number seven is the number of perfection and completion. So when it acknowledges the seven horn, horns, it's saying that he's showing up in perfect power and in complete power. And when it talks about the seven spirits of God, and there's a, a few contexts to kind of understand um, this specifically, so feel free to revisit this, write this down, and study it. Uh, there's a reference in Isaiah 11:2, 11, and Jesus also speaks about these spirits in Luke chapter 4, 18 and 19. But those spirits are the spirit of the Lord, which is the spirit of power, which Jesus talks about in Luke 4. Wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. And so all of these things, the Son has come and revealed himself with perfect power and the seven spirits of God. And so when you think about this, for the Son to have had the audacity to go to the Father and consider himself worthy enough to take this book and open it, he had to be exactly who he was proclaimed to be. Otherwise, that scenario would look a lot different because they said there's nobody in heaven. There was nobody in earth. So none of the angels, no creature on earth, nobody was found worthy except for the lamb who was slain, the lion of Judah. As, in fact, the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus directly translates to Yahweh is salvation or Jehovah is salvation. So we look at these things and it's all circular. All of them are dependent upon each other. They all work in tandem. And so having said that, um, Let's put this in perspective. What, what is the benefit? What does, what does worship do for us? How does worship benefit me? If you're asking yourself that in this moment, that's a trick question, by the way. 
You should never look for at any point how worship should benefit you because it was never meant for you. It was never meant for you. And so if you go into worship with the idea that if I worship God, then I'll receive this, then worshiping God is just a means to an end for whatever blessing you call yourself looking for. And so if we have exalted ourselves to think that we can deposit enough to where God will bless us because we have, have bigged him up enough, as if whatever we think we can offer is enough to, to acknowledge the greatness of who he is, then we've got the wrong mindset. Worship, we should never look for how worship can benefit us. We should always look for how we can best express our worship in an attempt to show God what he means to us just because of who he is. So that being said, I'm going to revisit the old definition and my understanding at the time of what it was. To me, at the time, and I, I feel like in the perspective of a human to just somebody we reverence, worship was the visible, the audible, the mental expression of lowering in one's own self and acknowledgement of the perceived glory of the one it's directed to. It was the outward manifestation of our spirit bowing before the one in whom our reverence is directed. My current understanding is that it is an offering given in honor of the magnitude of God's personage. And so whatever that looks like, if that looks like your vulnerability in the service where you just lift your hands and cry out, whether you lift up a hallelujah, whether you sing a song, whether you, whether you dance at home, whether you're in the car and you're listening to a worship song and just thinking on his goodness, how you live your life and you live as a light so that other people would come to know salvation through the way that they see your life. Through giving people the gospel, through discipleship, these are all ways in which you can give offerings in acknowledgement to who God is. Because if you understood a fraction of who he was, you would give everything you have to make sure that everybody you love would know him, at least in the capacity that you do. And in realizing that your capacity is not enough, you will constantly seek him so that you can worship him at a deeper level. And so what is your offering today? What is your offering to God? What does your offering look like? It is, is it your vulnerability? Is it your song? Is it your life? Is it your evangelism? Is it your, your shout? Is it your whatever it is that you have to offer? Maybe you can't speak. Maybe you're mute. Think on his goodness. Maybe, maybe you can't hear, but you can read and you spend time in his words. There are many ways... That's, that's the beauty of it. He's given us many ways that we can worship it, him. And the biggest, most important thing is your perspective when you do. So what is your offering today? I pray that somebody was sharpened today. I pray